This past year, we saw the passing of Queen Elizabeth. And for many of us, it's the first time we've experienced a king sitting on the throne. It was and still is big news. Regardless of your view of the monarchy, they do draw a crowd wherever they go. There are many people, as well as the media, that are truly obsessed with uh, the British royal family. And we're fascinated with royalty because their lives, uh, they appear to be so different from ours. Not just because they theoretically don't have to sweat out the bills, but <clears throat> because they live in the midst of luxury that is beyond our imagination. And they have someone waiting on them hand and foot. They have servants that look after them. And, you know, we even wonder, does the royal family even have to pick up the remote for the TV? Or do they have someone who does that for them? You know, click, click, click until they say stop. When we think of royalty, we usually think of the fringe benefits, the luxury, the servants, the underlying or the undying adoration of their subjects. <clears throat> it's the same with celebrities to a certain extent, especially sports celebrities. You know, when we hear about their multi-million dollar salaries, we say, oh, it must be nice, as if their lives are easy. But I, for one, am not sure that I would want to take the physical beating that, you know, a football or hockey players take week in and week out. I much prefer watching the action from my couch with my potato chips and my coffee. It's the same with movie stars. We hear about their movie deals and we see their lavish homes on TV, but we forget that making movies is demanding physical work and it takes a toll on personal relationships as they often are away from their family for days and days on edge, on end. And, you know, when we think of royalty and celebrities, we usually think of the privilege that it offers, not the responsibility that comes with it. That's why Bill Murray said that being famous is nothing like you would expect. You think it will be a life of leisure and there are moments of riding in limos and having someone carry your bag, but it's also a 24 hour a day job. You know, he went on to say, to people who want to be rich and famous, I'd say, get rich first and see if that doesn't cover it. In other words, see if you can find a way to enjoy the luxury without any of the responsibility. That's what some people think life in the royal family is like. In the 1970s, there was a popular book in Christian circles called How to Live Like a King's Kid. It wasn't uh, uh, written by a theologian. It was written by a businessman who had been uh, very successful but found himself miserable until he experienced a, a life-transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. And afterwards, it became his mission to go through life spreading joy and ministering God's love uh, to uh, everyone he met. How to Live Like a King's Kid was often criticized as just another prosperity gospel, name it and claim it type of manual. And there was some of that kind of theology in the book, but the book actually talked uh, about much more than just being blessed. It talked about a great deal, or talked a great deal about uh, being a blessing uh, to others. You see, we're children of the King, it's true. And we deserve to live like children of the King. But what exactly does that mean? Well, what do we see in Jesus? I mean, he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the crown of all creation. His birth was announced in ways that were lavishly spectacular and uh, profoundly humble. Think about it. He's the king of kings, yet his parents were a poor Jewish carpenter and a teenage maiden. His birth didn't make the papers, uh, but it was announced in the stars. For years before the date of his birth, priests and astronomers from another country and another religion gazed at the eastern sky and perceived that something was up and they knew that the king was coming. And so they traveled a great distance to see him, following this distant star in order to bring him uh, the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, which are strange gifts for a child, but fitting for a king. 
Although I don't know uh, the dollar value of these gifts, it's generally accepted that the gifts were extremely valuable. Maybe they even financed the ministry of Jesus decades later. And yet, this king whose birth was proclaimed in the stars and who received valuable gifts uh, from wealthy travelers was literally born in a barn. He was born in a stable. It didn't make the evening news, but a heavenly host of angels appeared in the sky and began to sing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. That's from uh, Luke 2.14. And to whom did they sing? The political and the religious leaders of the day? No. They sang to a bunch of teenage shepherd boys working the night shift at their minimum wage job. And the angel said, Do not be afraid, for behold, uh, bringing you good news, good tidings of great joy, which will be, for, uh, be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Luke 2, verses 10 to 12. So you see the extravagance uh, fit for the greatest of all the kings, the stars proclaiming his coming, the angels announcing his birth, the wealthy priests bestowing him with lavish gifts. And you see the simple humility of this man, born in a stable, in the presence of farm animals, to an unmarried working class father and peasant mother. What's most interesting about this king of all kings is that his life was not a life of privilege. It was a life of sacrifice, a life of surrender, a life of service. He said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. Matthew 20, 28. He said, the student is not above the teacher nor the servant above his master, Matthew 10, 24. So that whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, Matthew 20, 26. Jesus, the King of all kings, came to be a servant. And we, the children of the King, are called to do the same. We are called to a life of service. Yes, we also have a, a life of privilege because God is on our side. We can expect blessings and acts of kindness and gifts from above because we are his children and God is good to his people. But the real life of royalty is not about being served. It's about being a servant. So today we'll look at another psalm, Psalm uh, 72, um, uh, which was read earlier. This one is actually attributed to Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, the writer of the book of Proverbs um, and the son of David the king. In this psalm, which is a prayer, Solomon asked God not for more wealth and power, but for more skill and leadership. He doesn't ask God to give him more things. He asked God to empower him to give more things to others. Today, as we approach the Christmas holiday, I want you to consider three gifts that you, as a king's kid, can give to the world around you. First of all, rescue those who you can rescue. Verse four, may he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. You know, basketball legend John Wooden once said, you can't live a perfect day without doing something for someone who will never be able to repay you. In 1987, a real estate agent named uh, Oral Lee uh, Brown was speaking to a group of kids in an inner city uh, school in Oakland, California. And she made a bold a promise to them. She said, if you'll stay in school, I'll see you through to college. Mrs. Brown was not wealthy at the time. She you know, earned less than $50,000 per year, but she knew these children weren't living in an environment that bred opportunity. And they desperately needed someone to stand up for them. So she stood up. 
She had a dozen years to prepare, and sure enough, 12 years later, she made good on her promise, sending 19 students off to the college of their choice. God inspired her to rescue a class uh, full of children, and she did. I read about a uh, story of a young boy named Christopher uh, Tomoko. And on Thanksgiving Day in 2007, this is U.S. Thanksgiving, he and his mother were driving down a, a winding Arizona highway when she lost control of the van and it drove off a 300-foot um, ravine. Uh, she was killed in the crash. The boy managed to crawl out of the van and began wandering through the desert to find help. Several hours after, um, or several hours later, I guess it was, after it was dark, he was found by a young man named Manuel uh, Sabrinas. Manuel was a 26-year-old bricklayer who had just entered the U.S. illegally and was trying to sneak his way into Tucson. He found the boy wandering through the dark desert, dazed and disoriented, alone and afraid, and Manuel knew what he needed to do. After they went back to the van to determine that the mother had not survived, Manuel gave Christopher his sweater, he shared his food with him and built a fire to keep them warm, and he kept watch through the night with him while the boy slept. The next day, the two were rescued. Christopher was flown to the hospital in Houston, and Emmanuel was arrested and sent back to Mexico. This man, whose full name was, is, uh, uh, or was Manuel Jesus Cordova Sobrines, gave up his dream to rescue someone else. And you know, from time to time, you'll have the opportunity to uh, rescue someone. Don't let it pass you by. It can be as simple as buying groceries for a family going through a hard time, giving a Christmas gift to someone who might not receive uh, many this year, or visiting someone who spends too much of their time alone. As King's kids, we're called to defend the afflicted, to help the helpless, to look for uh, the chance to rescue someone. Secondly, we need to refresh those who need to be refreshed. Solomon wrote, verse 6, May he be like the rain falling on the mown field, like showers uh, watering the earth. Someone once said, A word of encouragement during a failure is worth more than an hour of praise after success. Good leaders understand this. So do effective parents and husbands and wives and employers and and uh, friends, when you speak words of encouragement to someone else, it's like you're nurturing new life. You're replenishing the earth. You're watering fertile soil. Kathy Truitt, the founder of Chick-fil-A, once said, how do you identify someone who needs encouragement? The answer, that person is breathing. Did you know, uh, did you know this, that that every person, every person you know, needs our encouragement. And do you know what else? No one needs your criticism. We're approaching the time of the year when families spend more time together. Uh, this is a good thing, unless we pass the time uh, bickering uh, with one another. You know, and I enjoy watching the occasional uh, Christmas movie. Uh, some of them are heartwarming and some of them are funny. Well, you know, Christmas Vacation is one of those funny ones that we laugh at. The Griswold family Christmas is full of one disaster after another. Everyone seems to avoid everyone else because they're constantly complaining and bickering at one another. There's not a lot of encouragement in the storyline, but in the midst of it all, Clark Griswold presses on to try to make, in, make it the best Christmas ever. Now the plot comes to a head when Clark's cousin kidnaps Clark's boss and uh, the police are called. And in the end, though, everyone's forgiven. So I hope I didn't just ruin the movie for you. But one of the plots to the story is that we try to do all this stuff to make Christmas special 
when what really makes it special is the relationships we have and the encouragement that we give. I'm guessing that no one will need to call the police on your family get together this holiday season. And I'm also guessing that the gathering could benefit from less critical remarks and more words of encouragement. In fact, every conversation in which you participate could use less criticism and more encouragement. Scudder uh, Parker said, people have a way of becoming what you encourage them to be, not what you nag them to be. So I want you to encourage, I want you to look for ways to encourage and to refresh others this holiday season. Here's a third thing that you as a, a king's kid can, ha uh, can give to those around you. And that is remain with those who need you. Verse five, may he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon and through all generations. Did you know what's one of the best gifts you can give to others? The gift of staying. The gift of being there, people need to know that you will be around as long as it's up to you to be around. A great example of this is the former mayor of Mississauga, Hazel McCallion, better known as Hurricane Hazel. She remained as the mayor for 36 years and she finally decided to step down at the age of 93. However, that was not the end. Earlier this year, at 101 years old, she accepted a position as a director of the Pearson International Airport. She's a great example of someone who remained. I cannot even imagine what it would be like to be a politician and the stress that comes with that. Most politicians work their way up the ladder to you know, provincial and even federal politics. And, and I expect that had she done that, she would have been successful. However, Hazel stayed and stayed and stayed to lead and serve the people of Mississauga. My point isn't about how often you change jobs or how long past the age of retirement you keep working. Um, it's about how much you are there for the people who need you. The people in your life need to know that you are there for them and that you'll always be there for them that you will endure as long as the sun and as long as the moon through all generations. Do you want to live like a king's kid? Then be there for the people who need you. Make yourself available. Be a remainer. Let them know I'm here for you and I'm not going anywhere. Living like a king's kid isn't about living a life of privilege and comfort. It's about living a life of service. The king of all kings came not to be served, but to serve. And we follow his example. Rescue, refresh, and remain. Do you know what these three words tell us? Help the helpless when you can. Encourage those who are discouraged. Stay with those who need you. And in doing so, you will be living the life of a king. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you um, for your son, Jesus. And as we prepare to celebrate this holiday season, Lord, help us to be children of the king, to be your children, and to remember that Jesus, when he came, didn't come to be served, but he came to serve others. Help us to keep that mindset, especially as we journey through this uh, Christmas season, but help us keep this mindset throughout uh, each day of the year. Give us opportunity, I pray, to serve those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.